Good morning, glad that you're here. A couple of short things I want to tell you about before we move into the message this morning. Uh, maybe you've heard that we are going to be renting the theater over at Regal, 76 seats, and we're going to be watching the movie The Forge. We are using this a, as a in-reach and an outreach for the church. The idea is this, we want you to buy a ticket for yourself and a ticket for somebody else and invite them to come. This is a Christian movie. It'll probably be very powerful to communicate the message of Jesus. So if you have somebody that you'd like to invite and they'll come to a movie, maybe they won't come to church, please do that. $16, you'll get your ticket, popcorn and a drink or candy. It's a pretty good deal. And also one other thing, in September, there's going to be a Hispanic church that is going to be moving into our building and using the sanctuary on Sunday afternoons. We are, we've been studying this. We're very happy to be able to share what we have. It's just one thing that we do. God has blessed us with this great facility, and now we can bless somebody else. So let you know that uh, good things are happening around this church. I want to start this morning with a story, familiar story to all of you. But once upon a time, there was an emperor who was obsessed with new clothing and looking absolutely the best. He spent a lot of money to look good. Well, a, one day a, con, a couple of con men show up, and they convince the emperor that they can make him a suit of clothing like no other clothing they've ever had. And these clothes would be so special because they would be invisible to the ignorant, the unworthy, and the unfit to lead. The king bought in. Silk was sent, the looms were sent. Suddenly, it looked like clothing was being made. But they were just pretending to make clothing. The king would send people over to make sure that the clothing was being made. But they couldn't see any clothing, but... Only the unfit and the unworthy couldn't see the clothing. And they didn't want to admit that. So they went back to the king and they told him, hey, it is amazing. They are doing a great job. Finally, the big day comes for the king to get his new clothing. He arrives, but he couldn't see. He couldn't see the clothing himself. But he couldn't reveal to everybody that he was ignorant and unworthy and unfit. So he just took off his old clothes. The con men pretended to put the new clothes on him, and then a parade was held. Now, none of the people in the parade wanted to admit what they were looking at, that they were seeing a naked king walking down the street, because that would then show their ignorance and their unworthiness and their unfitness. That happened until a little kid shouts out, the king is naked. He has no clothes on. Now you think that would have done it, but it didn't. The emperor just stuck out his chest and he walked all the more proudly because at this point, what else could he do? We're living in a day where everything from politicians to educators to social media influencers, some, some even religious organizers, they're endorsing ideas and philosophies and beliefs that they're promoting as intellectual and cool, but they're nothing more than a naked emperor making its way through our culture. And because we don't want to look ignorant or unfit or unworthy, we don't speak up. We just go along with the charade. Probably today, transgenderism is one of the biggest ones that we're facing. I take my grandkids out in public and they see a man with a beard and a dress on and their eyes open up and it's like, what's that all about? But somehow we don't want to see this anymore. Well, we're starting a new series today called Defiant. Defiant means that we're not going to go along with the charade that the world is playing. Now, we don't have to be mean about this. But we don't have to play games and pretend that what we're seeing is intellectual or the truth. God's house is about the light, not protecting people who want to remain in their darkness. So every message in this series, we're going to talk about a different thing that we will do to defy what's going on in our culture around us. 
This is not a negative series, but it's really just about our response to do what is right in the face of lies. And today we're going to start by talking about this, that as a church and as Jesus followers, we are just going to remain defiantly rooted in Scripture. You're in a Bible church today, and, you're, and in this church, we're going to re- remain rooted in Scripture no matter how much it upsets somebody, no matter what somebody says that the Bible doesn't really teach that, no matter what the radio and TV might say, no matter who may sue us, no matter what laws may be passed in our land that says we can't believe the things in the Bible or talk about them, no matter what any education system says or may mock us, no matter what, we're going to remain rooted and grounded in Christian Scripture. And I fully understand that in our culture, that we live in a time where people are promoting tr- finding truth from within ourselves. But in God's church, in God's culture, we find truth outside of ourself. And the Bible is the main tool where we find truth. The Bible puts forth many things that it says are true and real. Sometimes when I'm talking to people, I will ask them, what is it that you believe? And then I'll say, why do you believe that? And then, how do you know that this is true? And then the last question is, how has believing this changed your life for the better? I ask that because everybody has some map, some source, some truth that they're following. It may be the Bible, it may be something else. But we all believe something. We all have a source of truth. And that source of truth that you believe is producing you to be a certain kind of a person in this world. Now, we're li- we live in a time of a, a very confused culture, and it's changing every day. You, you can't really keep up what you're supposed to be believing. And our culture is really centered on feeling good, being happy. But in this culture, we, as God's people, we're going to defy our culture and just remain rooted to the Bible. That the Bible is a sacred, a supernatural source of what is true, what is right, what is moral, what is holy, and it tells us a story. Now, we are always being told to move on from the Bible, but we're not going to do that. If you came here today and, and you thought, I don't want to be one of those kind of dogmatic Christians, Bible Christians, and you want to find a church that is hipper and more cool than we, that is in, open to new interpretations of Scripture, well, then maybe you should move on. This is probably not the church for you. But as, you, as we go through this talk, I think you'll see why we are going to remain rooted to the Scripture. So, If this hasn't happened to you in a while, let me introduce you to the Bible. Let me introduce you to the most politically incorrect book in the world today. And this book doesn't care what culture thinks about it. This book will never bend to a special interest. This book has a never-changing set of truths. This book demands the same of all of us. And this book has been the most controversial book in the world. It's been vilified, attacked. There are those who have tried to discredit it, prove it wrong. It's been mocked. But it still is here, standing, blessing some, infuriating others. If you didn't know know this, the Bible is the best-selling and most influential book in world history. And just based on that, it's worth reading. The Bible has been translated into 736 languages. The New Testament's been translated into 1,758 languages. And there's all kinds of outside evidence from ancient writings to eyewitness accounts that have corroborated the historical claims of the Old and the New Testament. Now, we, we believe that the Bible is a sacred and a holy book that has been divinely given to us by God. 
to document God's work throughout human history. If you didn't know this, the Bible was written by more than 40 different authors over 1,500 years, but it has one unifying story, the story of Jesus. In the Bible, God enters human history and he uses human authors to tell us that he wants us to have a relationship with him through Jesus Christ. The Bible makes claims about itself. It claims that it's a divinely written text. It claims that it is unique. It claims that it is like any, not like any other book in human history. When people read the Bible, they are deeply moved. Their lives are changed. They think differently. No other book has produced anything near like the Bible. Jesus himself believed the Bible. Jesus believed the story of Jonah. The Bible is about real people who lived in real time and impacted the history of the world. The core message of the Bible is how God created the universe and worked in history. How he made a covenant with Abraham and then his descendants. And eventually this led to the Messiah, Jesus Christ, coming into human history who Jesus came to restore all things through his death and his resurrection. The Old Testament alone contains at least 121 prophecies that were spoken sometimes hundreds and thousands of years before Jesus was born. And yet Jesus fulfilled all of them, which is an astonishing feature in itself. This book communicates things about God. Think about it. If if, if a God created this whole universe, how would we ever get to know that God unless God himself revealed himself to us and spoke? And the Bible says that's exactly what happened. God entered human history through this word so that we might know him. I know that we have a lot of people in our country who just don't read the Bible and they think it's for religious idiots and little kids. We have professors in universities just down the street. I'm sure we have professors who are spending an inordinate amount of time to tear the Bible apart like they're threatened by it. Well, that is nothing but arrogance and ignorance because this book has been believed by billions of people who have lived all over the world, who have spoken different languages, who look different than you and me, and they're all from different communities. And are you saying that all of these people, all, every one of them, are idiots? That you are the only enlightened one? You need to experience the book for yourself. As I said, Jesus believed this book. Early martyrs died for this book. Missionaries have crossed the globe to get this book into the hands of, of everyone. The Jewish communities of old preserved this book under the threat of death. And Jesus is the embodiment and the fulfillment of this book. And by the way, this is the Word of God, the only Word that God has spoken and put here. He is not putting out any new books. He's not revising this book. He's not making a new edit of it. It's the book spoken once and for all. And because of that, because of all of that, we remain rooted to the Scripture. You can't hold a newspaper in one hand and the Bible in the other and treat them the same. You can't read Harry Potter in one hand and the Bible in the other and treat them the same. You can't watch a TV show and read the Bible and say they are equally weighted. But what's scary is that 35% of people who attend church never read the Bible. I'm going to take you to a watershed verse of Scripture that talks about the authority of the Bible. Paul writes this to a young man named Timothy. It's a famous scripture, 2 Timothy 3.16, and here's what Paul writes. But as for you, continue in what you've learned and what you have firmly believed, knowing from whom you learned it, and how from childhood you have been acquainted with the sacred writings, which are able to make you wise to salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. And then this famous verse. All Scripture, all of it, is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, 
equipped for every good work. Just a couple of things from this verse. First is this. We're going to remain defiantly rooted to Scripture because it is supernaturally alive. This is a, a living book. Again, 2 Timothy 3.16, all Scripture is breathed out by God. This is the breath of God. Jesus, quoting the Old Testament, said this, man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. This is the mouth of God. I heard a guy say one time, you want to hear God speak out loud? Open the Bible and read it out loud and you'll hear it. Hebrews 4.12, for the word of God is living and active. Jesus in John 6.63 said this, and the very words I have spoken to you are spirit and life. There's something different about the words of the Bible. They are otherworldly. They do something to your soul. And what is different about the words of the Bible? It is the Word of God with life attached to it. In the Bible, God has spoken. This is not the Word of man. There's a lot of elites and intellectuals are desperate to tell you it's just the Word of man so they can ignore it. But the Bible claims it is the breath of God. You ever see these people maybe in the mall and they're have a little oxygen tank behind them, and they got the little tubes coming up to their nose. Without that oxygen tank, they would have a catastrophic crisis. They would most likely die. What is in that tank, that oxygen, that pure oxygen, is keeping them alive? Well, in the same way, the Bible is your oxygen tank. Without this book and the words of this book, you will suffer a catastrophic crisis. The Bible apps actually resuscitates your soul. If you turn off the tank of the Bible, what are you going to be teaching? If you turn off the tank of that tank, oxygen tank behind you, what are you going to be breathing? You just take in whatever is in the air. And if you turn off the Bible, you are just taking all the toxic garbage that it fills the air, and you will become like everybody else, angry and fearful and protecting yourself. But the Word of God gives something else to fill our lungs with. It fills us with something from above, something supernatural, not corny ideas. And so if you remove the Bible from your life, you are removing your oxygen. Psalm 119 sort of has a cause and effect uh, of what the Bible does to us. Uh, let me just read this. Psalm 19, verse 7. The law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The rules of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. If I could paraphrase that, I would, I would put it this way. If you want to feel better, if you want to see better, if you want to make better decisions, if you want to think better, then just get into the Word of God because it's all there. The Bible is alive. It's a book of light. It's a book of meat. It does surgery on your heart. It will create faith in you. It will give you peace. If you remove the Bible, you remove all of that. This book scares the devil. It scares a lot of people. It is the authoritative guide for the human race. It has been divinely authored by God, and it's the only, the only book that we follow. The Bible is like a lot of other books in that it has white pages and there's black printing on it. But in this book, God is communicating information that will change you. One time, Jesus walked into this pool, this place where there was a pool. There was a lame man sitting there. And so Jesus looked at him and said, get up, take up your pallet, and walk. The moment the word, the words of Jesus were spoken, 
there is in the air at that moment the ability for a miracle. His words created a new reality for this man. It was just up to him to make a move to believe it. And when he did believe it, his bones started working, his muscles started working, everything changed in that moment. Now, I could have gone into that pool and said those words, get up, take up your pallet, and maybe it would have worked, maybe it wouldn't have worked, maybe you could say those words if you want, but I'm just saying this, when Jesus says the words, it has all the authority and the weight of heaven. And so in the Bible, you have the word of Jesus, the word of God. And just like that man by that pool, all you have to do is reach out and act and believe upon them and everything changes. So in the Bible, God has spoken. He has spoken his will. He's spoken his mind, his heart. He's spoken his law, his rules, his promises. He has spoken his warnings. He has spoken correction, wisdom, and insight. He has spoken of events to come. He has spoken uh, what is going to be established. He has defined the terms of life in this book. He always accomplishes what he says he will do. There's no error, no need for correction. And as God spoke these things, man wrote them. And so we have the whole counsel of God. Let's move to another point. Not only is the Bible alive, but we will remain defiantly rooted in Scripture because it creates foundations for living. It's something we call doctrine. Back to 2 Corinthians 3.16. All Scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching or doctrine. We just want to spend a couple of minutes here because the breath of God isn't just for inspiration. It's for doctrine. Doctrine is the foundational truths of life. Doctrine is like the rules for everything. So when God told Joshua to lead the people into the promised land, do you remember what God did? He said to Joshua, as I was with Moses, I will be with you. He breathed out his word, and that inspired Joshua. But those words also became the foundational truth or the doctrine of Joshua's life. And wherever he went, he said this, as God was with Moses, he is with you me. That's what it does. It inspires you, and then it becomes your foundation. Doctrine answers the big questions. Why are we here? Why is this world the way that it is? What has God done to fix the world through Jesus? And what are we supposed to be doing now that Jesus has come? Doctrine answers the question why there's suffering in the world. Doctrine answers the question why Jesus had to come in the first place. Doctrine is like the heavy steel girders of a building that just holds up the whole structure. And the doctrine are the things that you must believe. You must believe if you call yourself a Christian. If you are a follower of Jesus, it matters what you believe. You can't just believe anything and call yourself a Christian. You don't get to pick and choose the parts of the Bible that that are for you and the parts that are not for you. We are told that in the Scripture we have the teachings God wants us to follow. And this doctrine reveals the nature of God, the character of God, what we're to believe, what we're to do, what is the will of God for us. Doctrine is hard, and it's unbending truth. It's truth. And like gravity, you just ignore it, your own peril. You can say you don't believe in gravity, but that does not change the fact that gravity is going to work. And doctrine is the truth about everything. Listen to Jesus, John 17, 17. Sanctify them in the truth. Your word is truth. Isaiah 48. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God will stand forever. God's word will never pass away. It will never be changed. It will never be altered. God has never had to retract anything that he said. God's word has never had to be edited. 
But let's just admit the fact that God's Word speaks many hard truths into our life, into our culture. That's why we want to be rooted to the Word of God, because it is the truth. Even when the truth is, is not what we want it to be. But truth is what is real. Truth is what's always going to stand, again, like gravity. You can deny it, but it's still going to work. And here's the thing. When you remove the Word of God, you are removing the foundations and you are removing the truth. Let me, let me give you an illustration of this. If you lose the Bible, you lose the creation story. So now that you don't have a creation story that God in His love created this world to have a relationship with you, you have to replace that story with another story. So what do we replace it with in our world? We replace it with evolution. That you are an accident, that everything's an accident, that there's nothing worth living for, that you're going to die and be worm food. Now, that doesn't sound like a better story to me. If you lose the Bible, you lose the story in Genesis about family and marriage and gender and the meaning of sex. And so if you lose this, this story of marriage that God wants a man and a woman to come together to start a family, which is the building block of, of all society, and that there's only two genders, it, if you lose that, then you have to have another story. And so now we have the world making another story that marriage doesn't matter. It's just a social construct. That family, why have kids when you can have pets? And by the way, if you have kids, we'll raise them for you in our schools. And gender, you lose gender. And now gender is just meaningless. And I just want to say to you this, that because of our confused world that has lost the story, the doctrine of why we're uh, of gender, now we have 9, 10, 11, and 12-year-olds being counseled in school that yes, maybe they have been born in the wrong body and they are being physically mutilated through surgeries that will shorten their lifespan and in 10 years they're not going to want to be in that body anyways. They want to go back to what they were and then it's too late. That's what you get. When you lose the Bible, you lose the sanctity of life that every person is created in the image of God and every life is sacred. And so if you lose that story, you've got to come up with another story. And so the story in our world is the story of death, abortion, war, racism, putting people in classes. When you lose the Bible, you lose the story of sin and, and how sin has impacted the world and none of us are right. And when you lose the story of the Bible, you lose the story of the devil. And if you don't have a devil, people make up their own devil. So the Republicans are the devil, or the Democrats are the devil, or my neighbor is the devil. But whenever you lose the story or the doctrine of the Bible, you have to replace it with a worse story. If you lose the Bible, you lose the Good Samaritan. You lose the prodigal son. You lose grace. You lose God's love. You lose justice. You lose life after this life. You lose the story of Jesus. Now, I know a lot of people say, well, why can't we just have our own truth? Because two things cannot be true at the same time that are opposite. Two and two cannot equal four and equal five at the same time. We are people of truth. So, we will stay defiantly rooted in God's story and what God has spoken. And this is not going to change. We're going to hold this ground no matter what happens in our culture we are going to hold on to the truth of the Bible that has stood for thousands of, year, of years. Even in a culture today that wants to redefine everything, we will stay rooted to the Bible. And by the way, sometimes this is going to make people mad. It even makes church people mad sometimes, but it all comes down to this. God has spoken in this book. And he's spoken what he wants to happen, what he wants to do, who he's going to bless, who's not going to be blessed, how the end comes, how we stand before him. And we're going to even be judged by what is written in this book. So who are you going to trade this book for? What are you going to trade this story for? Some dead religious figure or philosopher? 
And, and let's just be clear. When God has spoken, He spoke perfectly. He spoke completely. He spoke precisely. And what He has spoken will never change. It's not going to be any more than it says now. It's never going to be anything less than what it says now. And what He says will always be in effect. It will always produce results. It will always guide rightly. It will always lead you to a fruitful life. It will always work. It will always be true. It will always be the final word. What God has spoken is not going away. One last thing here. 2 Timothy 3.16 says, All Scripture is breathed out by God. It's profitable for doctrine, for the stout things that we believe. Then it goes on with a, a whole list. It's also good for reproof, correction, for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete and equipped for every good work. The Bible can be hard because the Bible is confrontational to us so often. I would say this, that when you read the Bible, it's going to be like going to a rehab center. After Nancy had heart catheterizations, we'd often be sent to a class or some kind of thing to get us to think differently. They'd sometimes take this five-pound blob of junk and throw it down in front of us and say, that's five pounds of fat right there, and you need to get rid of that out of your body. And then they would talk about how to eat different and how to sleep different and how to exercise different in order to lose some things and to gain other things. And what, this is exactly what the Bible does to us. The Bible is going to challenge us, it's going to teach us, it's going to correct us, it's going to equip us, it's going to renew our mind, it's going to renew our heart, our behavior, our soul, our social context, everything. And then Paul says, when this happens, the man of God will be complete, and the woman of God will be complete and equipped for whatever it is that God wants to accomplish in us and through us and whatever we meet in life. Such is the power of the Word of God. It tells us how to talk. It tells us how to love. It tells us how to forgive. It tells us how to give. It tells us how to fight. It tells us what kind of spouse we're to be. It tells us the secrets of the Holy Spirit. It tells us God's will, God's provision. It tells us how to live above condemnation. It te teaches us about sex, about prayer, about suffering, about our relationship to the church. It teaches us about serving and death. The Word of God generates life, creates faith, provides guidance, makes the foolish wise. It makes the faltering strong. It makes the discouraged hopeful. It's the first book you should read to a child. It's the last book you should read to a dying person. It corrects the erring. It inspires us to be daring. It encourages the despairing. It, it humbles the overbearing. And from this book, you will learn your identity, who your family is, who your enemy is, the calamity of sin, and you'll also learn the royal pedigree of your life as a child of God and your eternal destiny as a citizen of heaven. But most of all, here you will meet Jesus, who alone mastered life and conquered death. We will remain rooted to the Word of God. Join me in prayer. Father, we thank you for the power of your Word. Now, through this church and in these people and these that are listening, we pray that you will give us a renewed love for your words. For in those words is our life and doctrine and foundation and power and equipping and completion for our own lives. Father, help us to pick up, pick, <clears throat> pick up this word and devour it. In Jesus' name, amen. Good morning, Riverside. Here's your announcements. Hello, Pop Park. We have a special outreach event just for you. On September 7th, we are renting out the theater over at Regal, 76 seats, and we are going to watch the movie called The Forge. It's a brand new Christian movie that's come out. 
that is a follow-up of the War Room, if you've heard of that one. We want you to buy yourself a ticket and then buy a second ticket to invite somebody else. It's sort of an in-reach, outreach for Riverside Church. So if you will contact the church office, we will get you your ticket and we will go together and maybe make a difference and change somebody's life. Invite somebody to the movies. Hey guys, if you haven't gotten the Riverside app yet, you need to do that today. Go to the app store and download it on your phone. It's the one-stop shop for all things Riverside. You can give, you can sign up for events, all kinds of things. See our calendar. So go ahead and do that today. Riverside has several ways for you to give. You may wonder why we don't pass an offering plate. A lot of that stuff went away during COVID. But we have a QR code here that you can use to give or you can give in one of our offering boxes. That's what I do. You can just give online. There are lots of ways to give. I encourage you to give to the church that you love, that is growing you and helping you spiritually. Come aboard with us financially. We invite you to join us for our upcoming Lunch and Learn, a Welcome Riverside class. This is the perfect opportunity to get to know us better and learn about Riverside. We believe that church is more than just a place to attend. It's a family to belong. Don't miss out. Register today for your next Lunch and Learn.